Lieber Lee, The Lost Continent, by Alistair Crowley. Benediction. United Conference of American Bishops. Reading, 12, Samael, 6, 12b through 15, 17 through 19. David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David amid festivities. As soon as the bearers of the ark of the Lord had advanced seven steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. Then David, girt with a linen apron, came dancing before the Lord with abandon, as he and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord, with shouts of joy and to the sound of the horn. The ark of the Lord was brought in and set in its place, within the tent David had pitched for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When he finished making these offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. He then distributed among all the people to each man and each woman in the entire multitude of Israel, a loaf of bread, a cut of roast meat, and a raisin cake. With this, all the people left for their homes. Reponsorial Song 24, 7, 8, 9, 10. Response Who is this King of glory? It is the Lord. Lift up, O gates, your lentils. Reach up your ancient portals, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory in? It is the Lord. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is this King of glory? It is the Lord. Lift up, O gates, your lentils. Reach up your ancient portals, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? It is the Lord. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? It is the Lord. The 25th Surah of St. Muhammad's Revelation, al Furqan, the standard of true and false, through verse 25. The message of the Quran, a translation and explanation by Muhammad Asad of the United Kingdom. There is little doubt that this surah belongs to the middle group of Meccan revelations and is almost contemporaneous with Maryam, which can be placed chronologically in the fifth or the beginning of the sixth year of the Prophet's mission, the title by which it has always been known, al Furqan, pithily circumscribes the main theme of this surah, namely, the statement that it is the innermost porpor of every divine revelation to provide man with a stable criterion of true and false or right and wrong and thus with a standard of moral valuation binding on the individual and on society. Consequent upon this proposition is the stress of the humanness of every apostle sent by God to man. 
in rebuttal of the false argument that the Quran could not have been God-inspired, inasmuch as Muhammad was but a mortal human being who shared the physical needs of all other mortals and took part in all normal human activities. By implication, the revelation of the divine writ is shown as belonging to the same majestic order of God's creative activity as all the visible phenomena of nature. But men do not easily submit to divine guidance. Hence, on the day of judgment, the prophet himself will point out that many of his own followers had come to regard this Quran as something that ought to be discarded. A statement of particular significance for our time. In the name of God, the most gracious, the dispenser of grace, hallowed is he who from on high, step by step, has bestowed upon his servant the standard by which to discern the true from the false, so that to all the world it might be a warning. He to whom the dominion over the heavens and the earth belongs, and who begets no offspring, and has no partner in his dominion, for it is he who creates everything, and determines its nature in accordance with his own design. And yet, some choose to worship instead of him imaginary deities that cannot create anything but are themselves created and have it not within their power to avert harm from or bring benefit to themselves and have no power over death nor over life nor over resurrection. Moreover, those who are bent on denying the truth are wont to say, this Quran is nothing but a lie he himself has devised with the help of other people, who thereupon have perverted the truth and brought a falsehood into being. And they say, fables of ancient times, which he has caused to be written down so that they might be read out to him at morn and evening. Say, O Muhammad, he who knows all the mysteries of the heavens and the earth has bestowed from on high this Quran upon me. Verily, he is much forgiving, a dispenser of grace. Yet they say, what sort of apostle is this man who eats food like all other mortals and goes about in the marketplaces? Why has not an angel visibly been sent down unto him to act as a warner together with him? Or why has not a treasure been granted to him by God? Or he should at least have a bountiful garden so that he could eat thereof without effort. And so these evildoers say unto one another, If you were to follow Muhammad, you would follow but a man bewitched. See to what they liken thee, O prophet, simply because they have gone astray and are now unable to find a way to the truth. Hallowed is he who, if it be his will, shall give thee something better than that whereof they speak, gardens through which running waters flow, and shall assign to thee mansions of bliss in the life to come. But nay, it is the very coming of the last hour to which they give the lie. However, for such as give the lie to the announcement of the last hour, we have readied a blazing flame when it shall face them from afar. They will hear its angry war and its hiss. And when they are flung, linked all together into a tight space within, they will pray for extinction there and then. But they will be told, 
Pray not today for one single extinction, but pray for many extinctions. Say which is better, that or the paradise of life abiding, which has been promised to the God conscience as their reward and their journey's end. In that paradise, they shall have whatever they may desire, their end to abide, a promise given by the sustainer, always to be prayed for. But as for people who are oblivious of thy sustainer's oneness, one day he will gather them together with all that they now worship instead of God, and will ask those to whom Divinity was falsely ascribed. Why it was it you who led these my creatures astray? Or did they by themselves stray from the right path? They will answer, Limitless art thou in thy glory. It was inconceivable for us to take for our masters anyone, anyone but thyself. But as for them, Thou didst allow them and their forefathers to enjoy the pleasures of life to such an extent that they forgot all remembrance of thee, for they were people devoid of all good. Thereupon God will say, And now they whom you regard as divine have given the lie to all your past assertions. And you can neither ward off your punishment, nor obtain any succor. For whoever of you has committed such evil, him shall we cause to taste great suffering. And even before thee, O Muhammad, we never sent as our message bearers any but mortal men, who indeed ate food like other human beings, and who and went about in the marketplaces. For it is thus that we cause you human beings to be a means of testing one another. Are you able to endure this test with patience? For remember, O man, thy sustainer is truly all-seeing. But those who do not believe that they are destined to meet us are wont to say, Why have no angels been sent down to us? Or why do we not see our sustainer? Indeed, they are far too proud of themselves, having rebelled against God's truth and with utter disdain. Yet, on that day, the day on which they shall see the angels, there will be no glad tiding for those who were lost in sin, and they will exclaim, By a forbidding ban are we from God's grace debarred, for we shall have turned towards all the supposedly good deeds they ever wrought, and shall have transformed them into scattered dust. Whereas on that same day, those who are destined for paradise will be graced with the best of abodes and the fairest place of repose. And on that day, on which the skies together with the clouds shall burst asunder and the angels are made to descend in a mighty descent. End of reading. Surah 25 at verse 25. Liber Li, The Lost Continent, An Account of the Continent of Atlantis the manners and customs, magical rites and opinions of its people, together with a true account of the catastrophe, so called, which ended it in its disappearance. The Blue Equinox, numerous other poems, essays and short stories were written during this summer, 1913. In particular, there is a sort of novel the Lost Continent, purporting to give an account of the civilization of Atlantis, I sometimes feels 
that this lacks artistic unity. At times, it is a fantastic rhapsody describing my ideals of utopian society, but some passages are a satire on the conditions of our existing civilization, while others convey hints of certain profound magical secrets or anticipations of discoveries in science. The Confessions of Aleister Crowley. Last year, I was chosen to succeed the venerable Kinosis Zeus, who had it in his mind to die, that is, to join them and Venus as one of the seven heirs of Atlantis. And I have been appointed to declare, so far as may be found possible, the truth about that mysterious lost land. Of course, no more than one-seventh of the wisdom is ever confided to any one of the seven. And the seven meet in council but once in every 33 years. But its preservation is guaranteed by the interlocked system of dreaming true and of preparation by antimony. The former almost explains itself. The latter is almost inconceivable to normal men. Its essence is to train a man to be anything by training him to be its opposite. At the end of anything, think they, it turns out to be its opposite, and that opposite is thus mastered without having been soiled by the labor of the student. and without the false impressions of early learning left upon his mind. I myself, for example, had unknowingly been trained to record these observations by the life of a butterfly. All my impressions come clear on the soft wax of my brain. I had never worried because the scratch on the wax in no way resembled the sound it represented. In other words, I observed perfectly because I never knew that I was observing. So if you pay sufficient attention to your heart, you will make it palpitate. I accordingly proceed to a description of the country. 1. Of the plains beneath Atlas and the servile race. There were four, some say five, distinct races, each having several sub races, but the main characteristics were the same. Some alleged the Portuguese and the English to be survivals of this or kindred stock. Atlas is the true name of this archipelago. Continent is an altogether false term, for every house or mountain peak was cut from its fellows by natural, though often very narrow, waterways. The African Atlas is a mere offshoot of the range. It was the true Atlas that supported the ancient world by its moral and magical strength, and hence the name of the fabled globe-bearer. The root is the Lumerian, Tilla, or Tilles, black, for reasons which will appear in due course. A is the feminine prefix, derived from the shape of the mouth when uttering the sound black woman is therefore as near a translation as one can give in English. The Latin has a closer equivalent. The mountains are cut off, not only from each other by the channels of the sea, but from the plains at their feet by cliffs, natural or artificial, 
smooth and undercut for at least 30 feet on every side. In order to make excess impossible, these plains had been made flat by generations of labor, vines and fruit trees growing only on the upper slopes. They were devoted principally to corn and to grass pastures for the amphibian herds of Atlas. This corn was of a kind now unknown, flourishing in seawater, and the periodical flood tides serve the same purpose as the Nile in Egypt. Enormous floating stages of spongy rock, no trees of any kind grew anywhere on the plains, so wood was unknown, supported the villages. These were inhabited by a type of man similar to the modern Caucasian race. They were not permitted to use any of the food of their masters, neither the corn nor the vast supplies of shellfish, but were fed by what they called bread from heaven, which indeed came down from the mountains, being the whole of their refuse of every kind. The whole population was put to perpetual hard labor. The young and active tended the amphibians, grew the corn, collected the shellfish, gathered the bread from heaven for their elders, and were compelled to reproduce their kind. At twenty, they were considered strong enough for the factory, where they worked in gangs on a machine combining the features of our pump and treadmill for sixteen of the twenty-four hours. This machine supplied Atlas with Zero, ors, or power, of which I shall speak presently, or zura'a, the zir is dwarot slowly, then the lips are suddenly curled back in a sneering snarl, and the vowel sharply and forcibly uttered. It is disputed whether this word is connected with the Sanskrit Shri, holy. Any worker showing even temporary weakness was transferred to the phosphorus factory, where he was sure to die within a few months. Phosphorus was a prime necessity of Atlas. However, it was not used in its red or yellow forms, but in a third allotrope, a blue-black or rather violet-black substance, only known in powder, finer than precipitated gold, harder than diamond, eleven times heavier than yellow phosphorus, quite incombustible, and so shockingly poisonous that in spite of every precaution, an ounce of it cost the lives on an average of some 250 men. Of its properties, I shall speak later. The people were left in all, the people were left in utmost slavery and ignorance by the wise counsel of the first of the philosophers of Atlas, who had written, an empty brain is a threat to society. He had consequently instituted a system of mental culture comprising two parts. One, as basis, a mass of useless disconnected facts. Two, a superstructure of lies. Part one was compulsory. The people took part two without protest. The same danger to society in our time has been foreseen, and an identical remedy discovered and applied in compulsory education in cheap newspapers. The language of the plains was simple but profuse. They had few nouns and fewer verbs. To work again, there was no word for to work simply. To sleep again, to eat again, to break the law. No word for to break the law again. To come from without, to find light. In essence, to go to the phosphorus factory were almost the only verbs used 
by adults. The young men and women had a verb language yet simpler and of degraded coarseness. All had, however, an extraordinary wealth of adjectives, most of them meaningless. As attached to no noun idea, and a great quantity of abstract nouns such as liberty, progress without which no refined inhabitant would consider a sentence complete, he would introduce them into a discussion on the most material subjects, the immoral snub notes, unprogressive teeth, lascivious music, reactionary eyebrows. Such were phrases familiar to all, to eat again, to sleep again, to work again, to find the light, that is liberty, that is progress, was a proverb common in every mouth. The religion of the people was Protestant Christianity in all essentials, but with an even closer dependence upon God. They asserted its formulae without attaching any meaning to the words. In a manner both reverent and passionate, sexual life was entirely forbidden to the workers, a single breach implying relegation to the phosphorus works. In every field was, however, an enormous tablet of rock, carved on one side with a representation of the three stages of life, the fields, the labor mill, the phosphorus factory, and on the other side with with these words, to enter Atlas, fly. Beneath this, an elaborate series of graphic pictures showed how to acquire the art of flying. During all the generations of Atlas, not one man had been known to take advantage of these instructions. The principal fear of the populace was a variation of any kind from routine. For any such, the person had one word only. Though the word changed in annotation in different centuries, witchcraft, heresy, madness, bad form, sex perversion, black magic, were its principal shapes in the last 4,000 years of the dominion of Atlas. Sneezing, idleness, smiling, were regarded as Premonitory, prim, premonitory, any secession from speech, even for a moment to take breath, was considered highly dangerous. The wish to be alone was worse than all. The delinquent would be seized by his fellows and either killed outright or thrust into the compound of the phosphorus factory, from which there was no escape. The habit of the people the habits of the people were incredibly disgusting. Their principal relaxations were art, music, and the drama, in which they could show achievement hardly inferior to that of Henry Arthur Jones, Pinero, Lihar, George Dance, Luke Fildes, and Thomas Sidney Cooper. Of medicine, they were happily ignorant. The outdoor life in that equitable climate bred strong youths and maidens, and the first symptom of illness in a worker was held to impair his efficiency and qualify him for the phosphorus factory. Wages were permanently high, and as there are no merchants even of alcohol whose use was forbidden, every man saved all his earnings and died rich. At his death, his savings went back into the community. Taxation was consequently unnecessary. Clothes were unnecessary and unknown. And the bread from heaven was the free gift of God. The dead were thrown to the amphibians. Each man built his own shelter of the rough stone sponge which abounded. The word house was used only in Atlas. The servile race called its huts huklus, equivalent to the English word home. Discontent was absolutely unknown. It had not been considered necessary to prohibit traffic with foreign countries, 
as the inhabitants of such were esteemed barbarians. Had a ship landed men, they would have been murdered to a man, supposing that Atlas had permitted any approach to its shores, that it hindered such, and by infallible means was due to other considerations, whose nature will form the subject of a subsequent chapter. This, then, is the nature of the plains beneath Atlas, and the character of the servile race. 2. Of the race of Atlas, in the city or house, which was formed from the crest of every mountain, dwelt a race not greatly superior in height to our own, but of vaster frame. The bulk and strength of the bear is not inappropriate as a smile for the lower classes. The higher had the enormous chest and shoulders and the lean haunches of the lion. This strength gave an infallible beauty, made monstrous by their most inexorable law. That every child who developed no special feature in the first seven years should be sacrificed to the gods. This special feature might be a nose of prodigious size, hands and wrists of gigantic strength, a gorilla jaw, an elephant ear, or any of these might entitle its owner to life. Godama Buddha was the reincarnation or a legend of a previous Buddha who was a missionary from Atlas. Hence the account of his immovable neck, the ears that he could fold over his face, and other monstrous details. For in all such variations from the normal, they perceived the possibility of a development of the race. Men and women were hairy as the orang outang, and all were closely shaven from head to feet. It had been found that this practice developed tactile sensibility. It was also done in reverence to the living Atla, of whom more in its place. The lower class was few in number. Its function was to superintend the servile race, to bring the food of the children to the banqueting hall, to remove the same, to attend to the disposition of the light screens, to ensure the continuance of the race by the begetting, bearing, and nourishing of the children. The priestly class was concerned with the further preparation of the zero supplied by the labor mills and its impregnation with phosphorus. This class had much leisure for work, a subject to be explained later. The high priests and high priestesses were restricted in number to 11 times 33 in any one house. To them were entrusted the final secrets of Atlas and to them was confided the conduct of the experiments in which every will was bound up. There was a governor of these, of whose name, nature, and function I am not permitted to speak. The color of the Atlanteans was very various. Though the hair was invariably of a fiery chestnut with bluish reflections, one might see women whiter than Aphrodite, others tawny as Cleopatra, others yellow as Duchi, others as strange, others of a strange subtle blue, like the tattooed faces of Chin women, others again red as copper. Green was, however, a prohibited hue for women, and red was not liked in men. Violet was rare but highly prized, and children born of that color were specially reared by the high priestess. However, in one part of the body, all the women were perfectly black with a blackness no Negro can equal. For this circumstance comes the name Atlas. It is absurdly attributed by some authors 
to the deposit of excess phosphorus in the zero. I need only point out that the mark existed long before the discovery of black phosphorus. It is evidently a racial stigma. It was the birth of a girl child without this mark which raised her mother to the rank of goddess and ended the terrestrial adventure of the Atlanteans, as will presently appear. Of the ethics of this people, little need be said. Their word for right is biff, made by blowing with the jaw drawn sharply across from left to right, thus meaning a spiral life contrary to the course of the sun. We may sum it as contrary. Whatever is, is wrong, seems to have been their first principle. Legs are wrong because they only carry you five miles in the hour. Let us refuse to walk. Let us ride horseback. So the horse is wrong compared to the train and motor car, and these are wrong to the aeroplane. If speed had been the Atlantean's object, he would have thought aeroplanes wrong. And all else too, so long as the speed of light was not surpassed by him. Curious survivals of these laws are found in the Jewish transcript of the Egyptian code, which they, being a slave race, interpreted in the verse manner. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Every male child, on attaining manhood, had a graven image given him to worship, a miracle-working image, whose principal exploits he would tattoo upon it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Atlantean kept one day in seven for all purposes unconnected with his principal task. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Though the Atlanteans married, intercourse with the wife was the only act forbidden. Honor thy father and thy mother. On the contrary, they worship their children, as if to say, This is the God whom I have made in my own likeness. One of the most brilliant children committed suicide on learning that he could not move his upper jaw. This boy is one of the eleven heroes who had statues in the high house, and the Atlantean for sorrow in its ultimate sense, Luca, or Weltschmerz, is to the wretch, is to the wrench at the upper jaw. Similarly, there is one exception, and one only to the rule of silence. It is the utterance of the name, which it is death to pronounce. This word was constantly in their mouths. It is Zura, a sort of venomous throat gargling. Hence, possibly, the Gaelic Zukur, speak, English, scour, or scar, in Yorkshire, and the Pennines, Zura is also the name of the high house and of the graven image referred to above. Other traces may be found in folklore, some mere superstitions. Thus, the correct number for a banquet was 13, because if there was only one more sign in the zodiac, the year would be a month longer, and one would have more time to work. This is probably a debased Egyptian notion. Atlanteans knew better than anyone that the zodiac is only an arbitrary division. Still, it may be laid down that the impossible never daunted Atlas. If one said, two and two make four, his thought would be, yes, damn it. I now explain the language of Atlas. The third and greatest of these philosophers saw that speech had wrought more harm than good, and he consequently instituted a peculiar rite. Two men were chosen by lot to preserve the language, which, by the way, consisted of monosyllables only, 
214 in number, to each of which was attached a diacritical gesture, usually ideographic. Thus, wrong is given as pf, moving the jaw from right to left. Wiping the brow with pf means hot. Hollowing the hands over the mouth, fire. Striking the throat to die, so that each rat radical may have hundreds of gesture derivatives. Grammar, by the way, hardly existed. The quick apprehension of the Atlanteans rendering it unnecessary. These two men then departed to a cavern on the side of the mountain, just above the cliff. And there for a year they remained, speaking the language and carving it symbolically upon the rock. At the end of the year they returned. The elder is sacrificed, and the younger returns with a volunteer, usually one who wishes to expiate a fault, and teaches him the language. During his visit, he observes whether any new thing needs a new name, and if so, he invents it and adds it to the language. This process continued to the end. The rest of the people abandoned altogether the use of speech, only a few years' practice enabling them to dispense with the radical. They then sought to do without gesture, and in eight generations the difficulty was conquered and telepathy established. This system of communication has great advantages over any other. It is independent of distance and dependent on the will of the transmitter. Te telepathic messages could not be tapped or miscarried in any way. Research then debited itself to the task of doing without thought. This will be discussed in detail in the proper place. There was also a listener, three men who took turns to sit upon the highest peak above the light screens and whose duty it was to give alarm to any noise disturbed, to give alarm if any noise disturbed Atlas. On their report that high priest charged with active governorship would take steps to ascertain and destroy the cause. The light screen spoken of were a contrivance of lamine of a certain spar such that the light and heat of the sun were completely cut off, not by opacity, but by what we can or by what we call interference. In this other subtler rays, in this way, other, in this way, other subtler rays of the sun entered the house. These rays being supposed to be necessary to live, these matters were the subjects of the deepest controversy. Some held that these rays themselves were injurious and should be excluded. Others consider that the light screens should be put in position during moonlight, instead of being open at sunset, as was the custom. This, however, was never attempted, the great mass of the people being devoted to the moon. Others wished full sunlight, the aims of Atlas being, they thought, to reach the sun. But this theory contradicted the prime axiom of attaining things through their opposites, and was only held by the lower classes who were not initiates into this doctrine. The houses of Atlas were carved from the living rock by the actions of the Zuro in its seventh precipitation. Enormously solid, the walls were lofty and smoother than glass. Though the pavements were rough and broken, almost everywhere for a reason which I am not permitted to disclose. 
The passages were invariably narrow so that two persons could never walk past each other. When two meet, it was the law to greet by joining in work and then going away together on their separate errands or passing one above the other. This was done purposely so as to remind every man of his duty to Atlas on every occasion on which he might meet a fellow citizen. The banqueting hall of the children was very, was usually very large. The furniture, which had been brought by the first colonists and gradually disused by adults, never needed repair. A vast open doorway facing north opened on the mountainside on to the vineyards and orchards, the meadows and gardens, in which the children passed their time. Suckled by the mother for three months only, the children, the child was then already able to nourish itself on the bread and wine, and on the flesh of the amphibian herds, of which there were several kinds, one a pig-like animal with flesh resembling wild duck, another a sort of manatee tasting like salmon, its fat being somewhat like caviar in everything but texture and a sure specific for any childhood's trouble. A third, the ancestor of our hippopotamus, was very tamed and was employed by the servals for preparing the ground for the corn, trampling through the fields while they were covered with sea water and thus leaving deep holes in which the seeds were cast. Its flesh was not unlike bear, but most delicate. Notable, too, was the great quantity of turtle, also the giant oysters, the huge deep sea crabs, a kind of octopus whose flesh made a nutritious and elegant soup, and innumerable shellfish added to the table. The waterways were haunted by shoals of a small and poisonous fish, called by them Zizu, an imitation of the swish of its tail and the cry of its victim, whose bite, whose bit was immediate, whose bite was immediate death to man, a fact which altogether cut off communication between one island and another except by air, as the hippopotamus animal, although immune to the bite, was unable to swim. Of the sleeping chambers, I shall tell more particularly in the course of my remarks on Zul. 3. Of the aim of the magicians of Atlas, of Zul, and its properties and uses, and that which is combined with it, and of black phosphorus. It was the most ancient tradition of the Atlantean magicians that they were the survivors of a race inhabiting a country called Limeria or Limuria, of which the South Pacific archipelago may be the remains. These Limurians had, they held, built up a civilization equal if not superior to our own. But through a misunderstanding of a magical law, some said, the second, some said the fifth, some said some the twenty-third, had involved themselves and their land in ruin. Others thought that the Lemurians had succeeded in their magical task and broken their temple. In any case, it was the secret Lemurian tradition that they themselves represented the survivals of yet of a yet earlier race who lived in ice, and they again of yet another who lived in fire, and they again of the earliest colonists from Mars. The theory, in fine, was that the aim of man is to attain to the sun, whence, according to one school of cosmology, he was exiled in the cosmic catastrophe which resulted in the formation of Neptune. His task on any given planet was therefore to overturn the laws of nature on that planet, thus mastering it sufficiently to enable him 
to make the leap to the next planet inward. Exactly how and in what sense the leap was made remains obscure, even to the heirs of Atlantis. The point was discussed fully and finally relegated in the Council of Stockholm, 1913. The men of Atlas could fly, it is true, and that by a method so simple that men will laugh outright when it is rediscovered, but they needed air to support them. They could not confront the cold and emptiness of space. Was it in some subtler body that they conveyed their palladium? Or, content to die, could they project that supreme vehicle across so great a distance? The answer to such questions probably lies in the recovery by mankind of the knowledge of zero and its properties. Beneath the labor mills run troughs in which the sweat of the workers collects and drains off into an open basin without the mill. The scene is so real to me that I find it impossible to avoid using the historic present here and elsewhere inadvertently. There are six other pieces of apparatus to insulate and carry to the basin the six subtler principles of sweat. In this basin churns with immense rapidity through multiple bevel gearing, a sort of paddle with knife edges. The sweat is thus churned into froth and gradually disappears and is as constantly replaced. The workers toil in shifts, eight hours work, four hours repose, eight hours work, four hours rest and recreation. The mills never cease day or night. The basin is of polished silver and agate and is set at an angle, facing two enormous spheres of crystal encased in a sort of trellis made of a certain greenish metal, its optical focus at a point midway between the two. The only sign of activity is that out of this focus a spark crackles unless the air be dry, a condition difficult to secure in this part of the world. Although fans blow air, driven over chloride of calcium and sulfuric acid over the globes of their focus, these fans are worked by tidal power, human labor being appropriated absolutely to the one use. In the temple of the house are two globes similar to these or those upon the plains, and the mysterious force generated below is transferred to those above, collecting within them. Now the name of this substance is always zero, but in its first state, the gesture is a twiddling of the thumbs. In its second, it is a rapid twiddling, twittering of the fingers. And in its third state of distillation, it is a screwing of the hands together. Within the spheres, it sublimes suddenly in the air as a snaky powder. Within the spheres, it sublimes suddenly in the air as a snaky power of, four, of silver, which immediately turns to an iridescent fluid, five, that is forced up by its own need of expansion through a fountain into the temple of whose floor it lies in its sixth semi-silent condition. Expert priests then gather this in their hands and rapidly shape it into its seventh state when it is like a knife of diamond but alive. An instrument like a Mexican machete is used to carve rocks. The edge shears them, the back smooths them, 
The rock behaves exactly like wax, responsive to the lightest touch. What is not used for weapons is then gathered up swiftly and needed by women of the rank of high priestess. It is not known even to the high priests with what they needed, but in its eighth stage, it is a substance solid enough to support great weight, but eternally heaving of its own force. Of this they make bed, so that the sleeping Atlantean is, as it were, continually massaged. To this they attribute the fact that the Atlanteans sleep never more than half an hour, though they do so four times daily. These beds remain active only for a few days, and they are then thrown into the ninth stage by being taken into a room where is a cauldron of great size. They are thrown into this sprinkled they are thrown into this and sprinkled with black phosphorus. Only the smallest quantity is required, and it is unchanged, its function being purely catalytic. This form of phosphorus is one of the most stable elements. It combines, so far as known, only with zero. But if thrown out of such a combination, it becomes ordinary yellow phosphorus. The zero then divides into two parts, one liquid, one solid. Neither of these has any ascertainable properties, for it is absolutely passive to the will of the user, who may taste therein his utmost desire, whether for food or drink. Among adults, there is no other food or drink than this. The children are not allowed to taste it. The black phosphorus is always added by a high priestess, and it is not known to me in what manner she does this. The zero that may remain is the subject of eternal experiments by the magicians. It is generally thought by the greatest of them that an error was committed in bringing to a ninth stage of division into two and many openly deplored the discovery of black phosphorus. All, however, strive in harmony to produce a tenth stage that shall surpass the virtues of the ninth. Theoretically, it is possible to reach an eleventh stage wherein the zero takes human form and lives. Opinion is divided as to whether this was not actually done by a certain magician at the time of the passing of Atlas. In any case, I beg the reader to remember that I have only described one-seventh of the virtues of Zero, and I have even omitted this, that in its ninth stage, it is not only food and drink, but universal medicine, if properly understood, for Zero is also a vision and a voice. 14. Now the muscles of the people of Atlas are the muscles of giants, and yet they do one thing only. And this thing is combined by the wisdom of the magicians, so that it is at the same time work, exercise, sport, game, pleasure, and all else that may fulfill life. This work never ceases. It has these parts. One, working at zero, in essence, bringing it from the first stage to the ninth. Two, working with zero, in essence, for one's own particular purpose. Three, working for zero. This is the common and most honorable task, the zero eaten and drunken, being worked by the working into a quintessence of higher power, though identical in property with the common zero, this new zero, Atlas zero, goes through the same stages as the common zero of the serviles. 
but it is the result of free and joyful labor, and so serves the magicians in their experiments, and the governor of all for his sustenance. None, by the way, is ever wasted. For example, a tunnel was drilled completely through the earth and filled with zero. And it is said that by this tunnel, the Atlanteans escaped. This working, whether with or for zero, requires two persons at least at any one name and place. Great heat is generated in the working, and the bodies of the workers are therefore sprinkled heavily with the black phosphorus, which is incombustible. This black phosphorus, poisonous to the servile race, becomes innocuous to anyone who has been in any way impregnated with zero. This itself in its first state is as dangerous as electricity of high voltage. The reverence attached to zero is unbounded. At one time it was hymned as the father of the gods. Until the end, all children were taught to be begotten of zero. Though everyone might know who was the father. In spite of the absolute promiscuity, in spite of the absolute promiscuity of the Atlanteans, this was never in doubt. Owing to the special mark of each man, whose stigma or variation was infallibly transmitted. All such conception was, however, held in dignity. Its official name was the old experiment. It was carried on simply because the new methods of continuing the race were not perfected. Childbirth was therefore in one way an accident. Although a duty, everyone shrank from it. For though no pain or discomfort attached to the process, it was a sort of second best achievement from which proud women turned contemptuously. This was in part the reason why the father's name was never mentioned. On several occasions in the history of Atlas, the Zero failed. Although not changed in appearance, its properties were lost or diminished. In such a case, young men and maidens in great numbers were captured on the plains, brought into Atlas, and offered in sacrifice to the god. Their blood was mingled with the Zero in its third stage, and the latter regained its potency. This item is loosely used as equivalent of life. The sacrifice is described later, and the point made clear. Their flesh was eaten by the high priests and priestesses in penance for the unknown wrong. It was subject to other and terrible scourges, being the most sensitive as well as the strongest thing on earth. On one occasion, it had to be treated with a fox-like perfume prepared by the chief magician. On another, it was subjected to streams of moonlight from parabolic mirrors. The most serious crisis was some 2,000 years before the destruction of Atlas. One of the servals, riding his hippopotamus to the plowing, fell off and was instantly bitten by the poisonous fish previously described. Through an accident of boyhood, he had, however, for a reason too obscure to describe here, no such vulnerable spot as suited the Zizu. He survived and went to work, as it chanced the next day. The Zizu was poisoned. A third of Atlas died within the hour. The plant on the affected island had to be destroyed and all its people. It was only repopulated some 380 years later, and then for particular reasons of magical economy, impossible to dwell upon in this account. Marriage was compulsory on all those whose passion had been so exclusive and enduring as to produce two children. Further, intercourse between the pair was thus barred. The magician thought that it was inimical to variation for a woman to have more than one child. 
a fortiori too by the same father, and the custom further prevented these stupid sporadic outbursts of burnt-out lust which made so many modern marriages intolerable. Closely connected with marriage, the close of the reproductive life, the close of the reproductive life is that of death, and close to the little that remains. Death hardly threatened the Atlanteans. He would decide to go and see, as the old phrase ran, and take an overdose of a particular preparation of black phosphorus mixed with a very little zittle in the ninth stage, which ensured a painless death. That none ever returned was taken as a proof of the supreme attractiveness of death. The ghoulish and necromantic practices with which Atlanteans have been unjustly reproached never occurred. A little vampirism, perhaps, in the early days before the perfecting of Zell. But no Atlantean was ever so stupid or so ignorant as to confuse death with life. Besides this voluntary death, only one danger existed. As the use of Zell guaranteed life and health and youth, a centenarian high priest was no better than a kitten. So did it so did its abuse spell instant corruption of those qualities. As mentioned above, now and then the zero itself was at fault and caused epidemics. But from time to time there were deaths in a peculiarly loathsome form caused by what they called misunderstanding the zero. No other disease was known after the bringing of the zero to its ninth stage. All in disposition, being instantly cured by a single dose. Such mistakes were particularly common in the early days of its discovery, and before its use had become well nigh a worship. The first symptom was a crack in the skin of the temple, or sometimes on the bridge of the nose, more rarely of the eyelid or cheek. Within a few minutes, this crack became an open sore of horrid fetter, and within 24 hours, the patient was completely rotted away, bone and marrow. A circumstance of singular atrocity was that death never occurred until the spinal column collapsed. No treatment could be found even to prolong the agony by an hour. This being recognized, Sufferers were thrown from the cliffs at the first sign of the malady. In this way, two were all other corpses disposed. It was the most honorable death possible, for becoming bread from heaven, for the serviles, they were again worked up into zero itself, a transmutation which, in their view, would be well worth all the resurrections of the body and immortalities of the soul of the theoretical dogmatic her hearsay religions. So much then concerning Zero and the matters immediately connected with it. Chapter 4 Of the so-called magic of the Atlanteans Magic and Atlas was a science of science. It was the final integration of an all knowledge. In method, its theory was differentiation, and in theory, its method, integration. For example, the fifth of the great philosophers indicated everything is zero. To the keeper of the speech, at the annual sacrifice. This in spite of the fact that in that very year, two new forms of zero had been discovered by that same philosopher. It was the third of the galaxy who announced the ultimate analysis of sensation is pain, that of thought, madness, 
that of super consciousness, a state of trance induced by Zittel and valued above all things, annihilation. His successor had retorted that in this was the implicit postulate that pain, madness, and annihilation were undesirable. The third admitted that he had so mean his phrase, but destroying the postulate still stuck to it. All this was the foundation of much magical theory, and on these purely psychological researches was based the whole magical practice. There is no God was a commonplace. It only implied that the mind was wrong to try to conceive within it what was by definition without it. To set limits to anything whatever seemed to them the greatest of crimes, the exact opposite of the true path to the sun. The practical side of magic was for the most part a mere utilization of known forces, such as are employed by modern science. But the resources of Atlas were as great and the advantages incomparably greater. The whole archipelago was a laboratory. There was no question of the cost of research. Every man was devoted to it. Every man thought only of the main problem, how to reach Venus and its sub-issues. Further, the main laws of magic had always been found to govern and include chemical and physical laws. In the early days of colonization, Zittel was only known in its crude state. It was the genius of a single man that obtained the third state in purity. From this state to the seventh, it moved almost of itself, very much as radium does. The genius, having sufficient in this pure seventh state, made a sword and completed in three days the subjugation of the servile races. It was a stroke of fortune, this quickness, for on the fourth day the zero began to disintegrate. The magicians then began to seek a means of making the state permanent. In this they failed. No known state of pure zero is stable. For this, from this it will be seen how entirely Atlas was in the hands of the servile races. Fortunately, no trouble ever arose. The supply of labor was always ample, so that knives had always to be replaced twice weekly. But in the course of their failures, they discovered the infinitely more valuable eighth and ninth state of Zero. Tradition has preserved a hint of their efforts in alchemy with its problems of the fixation of the universal mercury, the secret of perpetual motion, and potable gold, the universal medicine. It had been theoretically determined, however, towards the end of the tenth state, that zero should be a solid, but whether this was confirmed is beyond my knowledge. To return to the main magical theory, the quintessence, said they, or universal substance, which some strove to identify with Heil, others with the lumen, Luminferos Aether, in the two-in-one liquid and solid, the former part being also twofold, fluid and gaseous, and the latter earthly, and the latter earthy and fiery. The combination of these four phrases of zero accounted for the universe. The quintessence is zero, in some state unknown and incalculable. Some expected to find it in its twelfth state, some in its seventeenth, others in a thirty-seventh. All this was pure guesswork. Some tradition to this effect appears to have reached Plato. 
and the Neoplatonists combined with those Jews who had preserved fragments of the Egyptian tradition to form a new initiated hierarchy, the echo of whose teaching is found in Paracelsus. At one period, too, missionaries, not colonists, as has been ignorantly asserted, there was no trouble of overpopulation in Atlas, were sent to the four quarters and party and parties landed in Mexico, Ireland, and Egypt. The adventures of the party who traveled south form an astounding chapter in the history of Atlas. It was they who discovered the magnetic south and whose observations rendered possible the theory which resulted in the piercing of the earth by Zittel. There was also a settlement in Finland. Its only remains in historic period is Lapland witches. Besides all I have recounted, Zittel had many extraordinary powers. These were, however, called lesser and discarded and forgotten in the absorption in the principal work. Nearly all of these are found in the combinations of Zittel in the sixth state with black phosphorus in varying proportions. This one, thus one product is called fiery flying serpent. A pellet pitched off and thrown into the air elongates itself and flies in the direction desired killing the person whom it strikes. Another was called Eye of the Gods. It was a metal resembling platinum and made into tiny mirrors worn in rings or even attached by a special process to the thumbnail. The seer could then behold any place or person he chose to name. A similar product, nearly all phosphorus, was like vulcanite and was worn inside the ear by anyone who wished to hear anything that was being said anywhere. There was also a red transparent lip soft, which compelled love in any who saw it. Its use had been abandoned early in the history of Atlas, through the witty satires of a poet and the more serious strictures of a philosopher who perceived its liability to abuse. Again, a thin paste of almost pure zero made the wearer invisible. The poet was again successful in bringing this into contempt by suggesting that people resorted to it to hide their ugliness. This poet was one of the few Atlanteans who suffered violent death, except in voluntary sacrifice. There was also preparation of zero, which increased the size of the user, and others which diminished it. In general use among the lower classes, until the very end, was the composition which made the body light. Careful adjustment would equalize its weight with the displaced air, and movements of the limbs would then permit flying. In this way, the overseers visited the plains and returned. The other and earlier art of flying needed no apparatus, but I am forbidden to disclose the method except to hint that it is connected closely with the art of dreaming true. These are but a few of the magic powers so-called of the compounds of zero but they will indicate the power of Atlas by showing what it could afford to neglect. Yet all these powers were implicit in the process of working. The art of prediction was in the same unsatisfactory state as it is in England today. Now, nor was its practice encouraged. A magician, a magician makes the future and does not seek to divine it. All true prediction was therefore necessarily catastrophe. The greatest good fortune seemed worthless to an Atlantean since it was accident, and if accidents are to happen, one of them may be fatal. 
they believed themselves to be equal to the whole tendency of things and proudly gazed at nature as a man might upon a virgin captive to his spear. Everything that was being was zero. Everything that was energy was working for zero. Outside this was but by product and waste heap. The arrangement of the houses was in accordance with the magical theory. There was first the high house, then four, later six, last ten, houses of houses, and to each of these was attached a varying number of ordinary houses. The high house was the central shrine of the whole archipelago and must be separately described. Chapter 5 of the High House of Atlas, of its inhabitants, and of their manners and customs, and of the living Alta. The High House was separated from its nearest neighbor by over 20 miles of sea. Its diameter was about a half mile and its height some four miles. It had no plains at the base and its cliffs went absolutely sheer and smooth into the water. It was in shape a flattish cylinder, but the top broadened into a pointed knob, somewhat in style of St. Basil's at Moscow. There was not a trace of vegetation, which, by the way, was despised by the Atlanteans. A child would kick a flower contemptuously, thinking, Thou cannot even move about, or pet it as an English degenerate woman does a dog. The only entrance was by an orifice at the top, but the base was tunneled so that from every house was a channel for the zero, which, having been brought to the highest perfection, was thus transferred to headquarters. The receptacle at the base being far below the earth and the zero further heated by friction, it seethed constantly into a bluish or purplish smoke. This was the sole substance of the inhabitants of the high house. In early days, the old high house in an island since destroyed by order of the Alta had been called the house of blood the inhabitant subsisting only on blood sucking from the living. The improvements in Zero had changed all that, but the idea was the same, to live only on the quintessence of life. Hence, while the houses ate and drank Zero, the high house drank its vapor. No children were born in it, and none below the rank of high priest dwelt there. Except for one matter, which was never thought of, though constantly spoken, the inmost mystery of the high house was the living altar. This had many names, world eater, unshaven because the razors of Zero were turned on its hair, fireheart, beginning and end, and so on but especially a word I can only translate as to her, a defective pronoun existing only in the dative. What the living altar really was is a secret of secrets. There are various theories, one a sort of avatar affair, another that the altar is a quintessence of some kind, another called to her, the angel Venus, the force of our aspiration. We know it only from its epithets, its veils. Thus it was that black which makes black white. It was 26 feet high and 15 feet across. O oh my Lord, it is the essence of the incommensurable. It was the wife of Zero, the heart of Zero, the desire of Zero. The Alta that eats Atlas, the swallower up of her own house, the pelican, the fire nest of the phoenix, 
according to the Cretus, or according to the Cretus of the poets, and the burden of his hymns of worship was that it must be destroyed. It was impossible to approach the Alta without being instantly sucked up and devoured by it. This was the greatest death and ardently desired by all. The favor accorded only to those who discovered improvements in Zero or otherwise merited sing signal and supreme recognition for from the state. Hidden men listened to the cries of the victims and thus learned the nature of death. It appeared that the black suddenly broke into a fiery rose. The only a mere compliment, luminous thing in Atlas, and shooting forward enclosed them. For some reason, which was never either guessed, the Alta refused women. Those who had seen Alta were, however, useless to instruct. They came forth from the present smiling, and even under the most fearful tortures that the magicians could devise, continued to smile. This smile never left them during life, and the conscious superiority of it was so irritating and so contrary to the harmony of life in Atlas that the women were killed and their companions were the future forbidden to approach the altar. Whatever theories as to its nature may have been formed by the magicians were upset by a famous experiment. A most holy high priest, a man who at puberty had insisted on immediate marriage with all the women of his house, a magician who had formed four new compounds of zero and discovered how to pass matter through matter, was honored by the great death. On reaching the last corridor, where the concentrated spirals of zero vapor whirled up into the presence of Alta, he bade farewell to the appointed listeners in the manner suitable to his dignity, and then, taking a last deep draught of zero into his lungs, rushed into the antrum. They heard him cry aloud, Oh, with surprise, and then with inexpressible rapture the words, Behold Alta, Urta, Behold Atla, Otla, which were and still are completely unintelligible. Their surprise was greeted when seven days later he came striding past them without greeting. He went to his house and shut himself up, was never seen or heard again, but was assuredly still living at the time of the catastrophe. This man founded a school of philosophy, or rather, it founded itself on what it supposed him to have discovered. And this school disputes with the Orthodox the credit of the final success. The lesser mysteries of the High House were concerned almost entirely with the creation of life and the bridging of the gulf between Earth and Venus. These were connected intimately. The theory was that its Atlantean brains could exist in bodies sufficiently subtle to traverse ether. The task was done. Some of the experiments were crude enough, and, to our minds, horrible. They attempted to breed a new race by crossing with snakes, swans, horses, and other animals, especially monkeys. The results of this experiment were sent to colonize an island, but escaped, and after many journeys reached Japan, where their descendant flourished still. The Greek legends of such monsters as Chimera, Medusa, Lamia, Minotaur, and Centaurs, the Satyrs, and the like, are mere filtrations of the Atlantean tradition. The only theory behind such experiments was that they were contrary to the natural order and so worth trying. Men of more scientific mind more plausibly passed zero vapor 
through seawater, but they only created serpents of vast size, which they cast into the sea about the high house as guardians. The sea serpents, whether legend or fact, the sea serpent, whether legend or fact, is derived from this experiment. It is quite possible that some still survive. Another school, objecting strongly to the sex process, which must be transcended as the Lemurians overcame gamation, vivisected men and women, taking various parts of the brain, especially the cerebellum, the pineal gland, and the pituitary body, and cultivated them in solutions of zero under the invisible rays of black phosphorus. The best result of this was a race of translucent jelly folk of great intellectual development. But so far from being able to travel through space, they could hardly move in their own element. Another school argued that as zero and vapor combined the virtues of the liquid and the solid zero, so a fiery state might be produced which would be which would so impregnate their bodies as to make them matter as to make them mates of ether. This school held that the fiery zero already existed in nature, in the heart of the living Alta, and asserted that those who died by absorption into Atla passed straight to Venus. Many of them, therefore, tried hard to obtain messages from that planet. Familiar with Newton's first law of motion, they further held it possible to prepare zero in such a state that a current of it could never be deflected or dissipated. And so, if it could be made in sufficient quantity, a bridge to Venus might be built by which they might travel. They, therefore, tunneled through the planet, as previously explained, to have a sort of cannon for the zero. But as their supplies were pitifully insufficient, they endeavored to also they endeavored to also to prepare as zero, which would have the power of multiplying itself. Alchemical tradition has some record of this problem. Yet another group of magicians argued that as nature had cast off the planets from the sun, a disputed point, some think this due to magic. Some think this due to magic, which if so completely destroys the argument, it would be contrary to nature to cause the planets to fall back into it. They busied themselves with attempts to increase the Earth's gravitational pull, and alternatively to check her course. Their schemes were generally regarded as utopian, but yet they could boast of the discovery of the Zittel that lightened bodies and of a kind of ether screen which generated mechanical power in inexhaustible quantities by making matter slightly opaque to ether. This engine only worked on a very small scale. A screen two inches long would tear itself from fastenings that would have held an earthquake, while the rocks in the neighborhood would melt in a few minutes and the sea boil instantly where its rays struck. The most brilliant of this school asserted matter is a disease of zero, which may be translated nearly enough. Matter is a strain in the ether. He explained gravitation in this way, plus two ivory spheres in a rubber tube. The strain on the tube is least when the balls touch. The ether is infinitely elastic and without friction. From these data, he collected the new in of inverse. From these data, he collected the law of inverse squares. A more mystic school saw life everywhere. It knew all that we know and more about ions and electrons. It saw every phenomenon as a manifestation of will. The crowning glory of this school was the discovery that Zero in its ninth stage, eaten and drunk with concentrated intention, 
produces the desired result. Whatever within wide limits the result might be. This went far to supersede the use of all specialized forms of zero, and so to unify the magical practice. It seems curious with all this magic, magic itself should be the thing most deplored. But it was the means, and as such, that which is in particular not the end. The word for magic, ejinx, was the only disyllable in the language. For magic was the essentially twofold thing more twofold in a way than the number two itself. It is interesting here to sketch briefly the mathematics of Atlas. This task is not easy, as their minds worked very differently from ours. The number one was a fairly simple idea, but two was not only two, but also the result of adding one to one and the root of four. The numbers grew in complexity out of all reason. Seven was six plus one and five plus two and four and plus three and so on. As well as the root of 49, half 14 and the like. They even distinguish 4 plus 3 from 3 plus 4. Each number also represents an idea or group of ideas on all sorts of planes. It would have been quite possible to discuss dressmaking in terms of pure number. To give an example of the way in which their minds thought, consider the number 3. 3 in so far as it gives the first plane figure suggests sup superficies are superficies with regard to the dimensions of space solidity three itself is therefore that ineffable ineffably holy number in which the superficies is solid of course, hundred of other ideas must be added to this, and to grasp and harmonize them all in one colossal, super-rational idea was the constant task of every mathematician. The upshot of this was that all numbers above 33 were regarded as spurious, illusory. They had no real existence of their own. A partial exception existed for prime numbers as being self-generated, and each of these which had been investigated had its special and comparatively simple signification. They were temporary compounds, these numbers above 33, unreal in very much the same way as our question mark, negative 1. They were always expressed by graphic formulae, like, it, like our own organic compounds. To take an example, the number 156 was regarded as a sort of efflorescence of the number 7. It was never written but as 77 question mark, 77 question mark 7 over 7. Question mark seven seven. Compare the arrangement at the center of the seal of the AA. <clears throat> so you have a whole number in the hundreds next to a fraction next to a whole number. So 770 question mark and 
700 question mark 7 divided by 7 and question mark 177. Again, 11 was usually written 3 plus 5 plus 3. It was always the aim to find symmetry in these expressions and also to find an easy way to 1. This last is difficult to explain. 11 was their great key of magic. It is a two-fold number in that the act of becoming one. It is a two-fold number in the act of becoming one. 37 was the presence of one, inasmuch as multiplying it by three gives 111, three ones, which divided again by three in another manner yield one. One would rather think of 48 as 37 plus 11 than as 4 times 12. It is the statement of an elementary textbook dating from the earliest days of Atlas. It was a sort of moral duty to teach the mind to think in this manner. The number 7 was the perfect number, with them as with us, but for very different reasons. It was the link between Earth and Venus, for one thing, I cannot explain why. It was the number of the Atla and the house of success, two being the house of battle. It was also grace, softness, ease, healing, and joy of Zittel, as well as play of phosphorus. Many mathematicians, however, attacked it with vigor. There was at one time an almost general consent to replace it by eight and its rapture combination 31 by 33. Despite the intense preoccupation with such ideas, mathematics as we know them had reached a perfection which, if it does not surpass that of our own civilization, fails principally because its theorems, handed down to Euclid and Pythagoras, although imperfectly, formed a springboard whence we might leap. The initiation of children was also a matter reserved for the high house. Weaned at three months, the children were tended by the lower classes until the age of puberty, an occurrence which fitted them at once for initiation. A legate from the high house was sent for, and in his presence the child was brought, acquainted with zero by both its father and its mother, and full instruction in working with further and full instruction and in working was further conferred by any member of the house who chose to do so. This in practice meaning that by everybody. The ceremonies were frequently long and exhausting. Children often died in the course of them. This was not regarded as a serious calamity. Some schools of magicians even pretended to rejoice. The representative of the high house had a prior right to the parents of the child. At times he conducted the initiation in person, a high honor, but invariably fatal. On rare occasions, male children were sent over to the Atla to be devoured. The parents of so fortunate a child were advanced in rank on the spot and had special privileges conferred on them, sometimes even being transferred to a house of houses. All those who dwelt in the high house were veiled whenever they appeared, in order to prevent it being known that they were of the same appearance in all respects of their as their inferiors. This, ordin this ordinance had been made after the great conspiracy, with which I shall deal in the chapter on history. Chapter 6 of the underground gardens of Atlas and of the alleged commerce of the Atlanteans with Incubi, Succubi, and the demons of darkness. I have referred to the contempt with which the Atlanteans were prone to regard the vegetable kingdom. Animals, including men, share their scorn. The idea may have been that with all their advantages, they ought to have done much better for themselves. 
Minerals, however, were regarded as helpless, and hence the extraordinary attention paid to them. Beneath the houses, the rock had been tunneled out into grottoes, some in old fantastic forms, but most in immense polyhedra are combinations of curves. Each house in some twenty of such gardens, three regents were made in the cultivation, the sea of metals, the sea of light, and the sea of an untranslatable idea approximating to our mystic's interpretation of Alpha and Omega. The two former produced simple effects. The first formed jewels, self-luminous, which yet grew like flowers. The second similar effects with metals, while the third brought any mineral to flower in the most extravagant combinations of color and form. All such conditions as texture, hardness, elasticity, and physical attributes in general were considered worthy of the profoundest attention. As an instance of these, I may describe particular gardens. One would have a roof of softly glowing sapphires, foxglove, bluebells, or gentian, and between these champak stars of ruby. The walls would be covered with tendrils of vine, within whose depths lurked tiny blooms of amethyst. The flower would be of malachite, but alive, growing of coral, growing as coral does, softer than any earthly moss and more elastic to the tread. On every darker leaf might glow dewdrops of self-strung diamond formed from the carbon dioxide of the air by the action of the seed of light. Another grotto would be a monochrome of blue, various copper salts being planted everywhere and glowing in incrustations and festoons of every shade of blue from the faintest tinge of Carillion azure to the depths of ultramarine and indigo. The floor would be mingled, translucent blue and green and gray, in whose abyss would be seen shapes of anemones, perhaps of such hues as iron oxide, silver chromate, and cupra monium, cyanate. All this floor would in all respects resemble water, but for its greater solidity. And floating on it would be great lilies, great green leaves of emerald with cups of pearl, not less than 12 feet in diameter. The corolle of pure gold, so fine that they glimmered green, was pistoled with pistols of platinum on whose tops trembled great pigeon-blooded rubies. Another might be holy of metal, a mere bower of jasmine, with its floor of violets. The law of growth of these creatures of wisdom was not that of plants or animals, or even of crystals. It was that of the earth, constantly growing at the planet constantly growing at the planet, approached the sun. They as steadily shrank as she departed to Aphelion. That was not growth and decay, but the rise and fall of an eternal bosom. It is probably, too, that this is one of the reasons why Atlas neglected the higher kingdoms. They had learned to grow, but on wrong lines and it was too late to endeavor to correct the error. These gardens were the principal places of working. It was hardly possible to pass from one place to another without coming upon one of them. So cunningly were they distributed, and in every garden would be found joyful and noble parties of workers intent upon their beloved task. The passerby would gladly join on of such parties, engage in the work for as long as he wished, and then proceed upon his private business. In these same gardens, too, were salvers and goblets always filled with zero, 
and after toil, refreshment fitted the workers to return to labor. Now of these workings, the garden's strange tales are told. It is said that the inhabitants falling to repose were visited by incubi and succubi. Whatever the nature of these may be, and I by no means concur in the opinion of Sinistrari. He wrote the classic on incubi and succubi. Manuscript note on one of the TSS of Liber 51, apparently by K.G. The reference is to a volume called Demonality, which has in the 20th century been published in an English translation by Montague Summers. The original was condemned for heresy, possibly because Senestari argued that Incubi and Succubi could potentially be redeemed, and the English edition prosecuted for obscenity. And that they welcome with su and that they welcome such with eagerness. Nay, darker legends tell of infamous commerce and intercourse with demons foul and malicious, and pretend that the power of Atlas was devilish, and that the catastrophe was the judgment of God. These medieval fables of the debased and perverted phallicism, miscalled Christianity, are unworthy even to be refuted founded as they are on hypotheses contrary to common sense. Nor would they who know themselves master of the earth have deigned to degrade themselves and moreover to vitiate their whole work by commerce with inferiors. If there be any truth whatever in these stories, it will then be more easily supposable that the Atlanteans aspiring to journey sunwards to Venus might invoke the beings of that planet, should it be possible for them to travel to us, and that this is impossible, who can assert? On the theory of the magicians, power increases as the sun is approached, the inhabitants of Earth being more infused with the magical force of our star than those of Mars, and they again more than those of great Jupiter, gloomy and disastrous Saturn and Uranus, or Neptune lost in star dreams. Again, the powers of each particular planet may, nay, must be wholly diverse. So fundamental a question of existence as the value of G, being vastly various, must not the inhabitants differ equally in body and in mind? What lives on the minute, an airless moon, what lives on the minute and airless moon can be no inhabitant of what may hide beneath the flaming envelope of the sun, with its fountains of hydrogen flaming an hundred thousand miles into the ether. And surely so wild an ambition as that of Atlas would not have been held by being so wise and powerful for many, for so many centuries, had they not either a sure memory of their coming from Mars, or some earnest of their eventual departure to Venus, man does not persist in the chimerical for more than a few generations. Alchemy achieved results so startling and so beneficial to humanity at large, one need only mention the discovery of zinc, antimony, hydrogen, opium, gas itself, that the original ideals were changed for others more limited and more practical, or at least more immediately realizable. Nor is this view unsupported by testimony of a sort, unreal and glorious, rays of our father, the sun, says one of the poets of Atlas. Are they within us? Let us call them forth by utterance that is not uttered, by the gesture that is not made, by the working that is above all working. For they are great and glorious, rays of our Father the Son. Then from our bride that waits for us in the nuptial chamber, green in the green west, blue in the blue east, exalted above our Father, 
in the even and in the morn, spring forth our heirs and our hosts to greet us in the darkness. Dim glimmering are our gardens in the light of the seed of light. They are peopled with shadows. They take form. They are serpents. They are ash trees. They are the holy Zura. They are as all things straight or curved. They are winged. They are wonderful. With us do they work. And that which was but one in seven, and that which was one, with us do they work, and that which was but one is seven, and that which was two is become eleven. With us do they work, and give us of the drought miraculous. Us do they instruct in magic, and feed us the delicate food. Let us call forth them that are within us, that they that are without may enter in, as it was made manifest by him that make it secret. This passage, not devoid of a rude eloquence, makes clear that makes clear what was held in exoteric circles. For in Atlas the poet <clears throat> For in Atlas the poet was not as in England a holy and exalted being, one set apart by his high calling, thrown in the hearts of the people, cherished by kings and nobles, one of whom no wealth and honor are too great to shower, but one of the people themselves of no greater consequence than any other. Every man was an artist in so far as he was, was a man, and every man being equally so in nature, whether in achievement or not, mattered nothing as appreciation was of no moment. Accomplishing art for the sake of art, the interest of the creator of the work died with its creation. It may therefore be possible that these words are those of the poetic exaggeration, or that there is a concealed meaning in them, or that they are intended to mask and mislead, or that the poet himself was not fully instructed. Indeed, it is certain that the only high house poet himself, indeed, it is certain that only the high house had the secrets of Atlas, and the magicians of that house held the undeniable, if sometimes dangerous, doctrine that the truth and falsehood of a statement alternated as do day and night according to the status of the hearer of the statement. However, so strong is the tradition concerning the angel of Venus that it must at least be considered carefully. The theory appears to have been that if the magicians of Venus invited the Atlanteans, means would assuredly follow, just as if a king summons a paralyzed man to his presence. He will also send officers to convey him. Now, whether the angel of Venus is really an angel in anything like the modern sense of the word, or merely, or merely a title of one of the principal magicians of that planet, it is evident that the high house ardently desired his presence, that this might be manifested by the birth of a child without the stain of Atla, was clearly an ultimate de sideratum, an outward and visible sign of redemption, an obvious guarantee of the reality of the occurrence. It was then a virgin high priestess who achieved so notable a renown, whether or not this is a mere poetic parable of the abiogenesis. If it indeed fair to describe it, of the eleventh stage of zero is another and an open question. In any case, such is the tradition, and numerous parodies of it are still extant in the stories of the births of Romulus and Remus, Bacchus, Buddha, and many other legendary heroes of modern times. We even catch an echo in the myths of such barbarous lands as Syria. So much 
and no more concerning the underground gardens of Atlas and of their commerce with the inhabitants of Venus. Chapter 7 Of Marriage and Other Curious Customs of the Atlanteans And of Sacrifices to the Gods I have already adverted to that most singular conception of the duty of the married which opposes the customs of Atlas to those of any other race on earth. But the considerations which established it have yet to be discussed. I will not insist on that gross and cynical view which might perceive in English marriage today a practical vindication of the Atlantean position. On the contrary, in Atlas, marriage formed the loftiest of ideals. It resembled the hermetic marriage of certain alchemists the bond between the parties was only stronger for the absence of the lower link. The idea underlying this was in the main a particular case of the general proposition that whatever was natural should be transcended. As will be seen in the final chapter, the very stigma of success in their great work was the transcending of the sexual process. The bond of marriage was not, however, entirely of this negative character. It had its positive side, and here closely resembled the so-called Christian doctrine of Christ and the Church. Husband and wife were to be father and daughter, mother and son, brother and sister, teacher and pupil, and above all, friends. And this relation was to subsist on all planes. The hieroglyph of love was a cross, that of marriage parallel straight lines, and as the cross was to be transcended in the circle, so were these lines to converge not on earth but in Venus. In the meanwhile, each partner led his own free life, and it often occurred that a woman, having borne two children to a man and married him, would bear to children, two children to another man, and so on for perhaps two centuries, thus acquiring a cohort of husbands. Such an arrangement must clearly involve such an arrangement must clearly have led to grave confusion had any question of property and inheritance been involved, but notions so unfortunate were unknown. Where all had every heart's desire, of what value were they? It is true that some division of labor, though little, was involved in a social scheme, but it occurred to no one to regard the supervision of the servos as less honorable than the offering of the great sacrifices. In a perfect organism, one part is as necessary and decent as any other part, and no sane observer can reason otherwise. For a perfect organism has a single definite aim, and the only dishonorable feather on an arrow would be one that was out of place. Human nature being what it is, one may nevertheless agree that this measureless content with the existing order, except in so far as the purpose of the establishment of that order was unfulfilled, was rendered possibly by the extreme lightness of the toil demanded of any individual. But it is impossible for slaves to understand free men. It is always a wonder to Englishmen that a man should devote himself to unremitting toil for an ideal. He is called a crank, basely slandered, the lowest motives being without any reason assigned to his actions, mocked, persecuted, perhaps crucified. This is partly forgivable, as in English philanthropy is almost invariably the mask of vice and fraud. 
the ceremony of marriage. There was also the marriage of those of the magicians who refused all intercourse with the opposite sex and were therefore married to the whole sex as such. Here was no ceremony used, but each had a special mark signifying that he or she was thus consecrated. The ceremony of marriage was simple, dignified, yet poignant. The lovers in the presence of their whole house publicly embraced for the last time. Their two children pressed them apart, elevating their hands in a crossed clasp. They gave way, and the children passed through, preceding a most holy image, which was borne by a priest and priestess between them. They then parted, and each was severally corrugated and embraced by any of the others who chose, and the priest and priestess then exalting the image and setting in a suitable shrine, closed the ceremony by the command to work and adding force to the same by their example. The education of the children was another important matter in which their ideas were wholly opposed to our own. It ceased altogether at the age of puberty, which was sometimes as early as six never later than 14. Were it so delayed, the delinquent was crowned in mockery with a square black cap, sometimes tassellated, and sent among the servos to instruct them in religion and similar branches of learning, and never permitting to return to Atlas. The ignorance and superstition of the plains was thus kept at a proper height. The method of education was indeed singular. Certain Atlanteans who made it their study would place various articles in the hands of infants and observe what use they made of them. In the course of a few months, the experts had accurately mapped the psychology of the child and it was led in accordance therewith. The marriage customs of Atlas allowed no too rapid growth in numbers and it was therefore easy to give each child attention. The method of opposition was again employed in education, the child's natural wish being constantly stimulated by a parallel training in the contrary subject. Children were also shown a series of ordered facts and an explanation given, but not the least pain was taken to ascertain whether the child had retained those instructions. They were left as impressions on the mind. The brain was not injured by the strain of being constantly forced to bring up its stores from the subconscious. It was found in practice. It was found in practice that every child learned everything that it was shown, and that this learning was already for use, and that this learning was always ready for use while the consciousness was never wearied or overcrowned. While the consciousness was never wearied or overcrowed, it was also found that those whose memories were what we call good were precisely those who failed to develop in other ways more useful to society. The most peculiar of all their methods was the search for genius. It was the business of the experts to pay the most serious and relevant attention to all that a child did, and whenever they failed to understand the workings of its mind, to place it under the charge of a special guardian, who did his utmost to comprehend sufficiently, to be able to encourage it to become yet more unintelligible. Apud eos membrum vero membrano lucido erat, ot quod quelis circumcisio di navitatis facto erit. Vix crederi dinu est tan quam verum feminarum montes venereales similitudine facis fueri facis dominace sordonese saturese cujos os erit ol os volve Des horribiles attic 
ridiculos. Ferot similaria di verorum que thingut singut imagines homum colorum fuere lege judaica tasse. Latin, we judge, be silent. And he says, I leave translation of the rest of the passage as an exercise for the reader, as there are few points on which I am uncertain. Although it appears to be describing inter alia, a curious form of body art, as well as alluding to Crowley's solar phallic doctrine. Crowley may be quoting, or more likely, pastiching someone. I am not sure. T.S. Uh, somewhat real time. This is now first, I'm sorry, the 31st of January, 2020. This was written 107 years ago. Uh, in that time, we have uh, what is called a babblefish or Google Translate. I would do my best to use it to translate this. And sometimes Google may have a joke. We'll see. So, apud ios membrum vere, apos apud ios membrum veril membrano lucido erat od quod quales circumcisio di navetates facto erit. It's translated as that among them a luminous membrane was a member of a man's. The quality because of the circumcision. Activity was built. So I think he's saying that the men had very beautiful penises as a result of a unique form of circumcision used uh, to affect that particular quality. Vix credere dignum est Tanquam verum feminarum montes veneriale similitud fases fuere. Fases domine se, so done que, and I'll continue. Hardly believe that it is as true. Ladies' mountains, venereal, were the likeness of their faces, the faces of the possessed, with devils on it. So, a, a woman's uh, vaginal area, it seems, or her pupusa, um, even though it sounds strange, uh, had the likeness of their faces upon them. It could also mean that her, her breast uh, was tattooed, as the note says with a likeness of a certain face. And so that's what it is. The breast of a woman uh, was tattooed uh, with the like of a certain face. Uh, those faces were devils. Uh, onyxes are, are black devils. Satyrs. There's cujos, os erat os volve. If there are a bunch of Latin speaking kids around and this is a concern for them, uh, I guess cover their ears. Or priests. Whose mouth was the mouth of the womb, the matter is to be feared and ridiculed. So it does seem like the women had tattoos on their vaginas, uh, which mimic the face of, let's say, their daemon or their personality. So either these faces were demons, uh, black entities, satyrs, and it seemed that the mouth of this being, so if you want to know the orientation of the tattoo, uh, was the mouth of the vaginal opening. Uh, Ferunt similia de verorum que thingut sicut imagines 
homon kulorum fare. Lege judica dasse. They, like the men who mowed, as the images were homocule, homunculi. Read, judge, be silent. Continuing, many of the men, this is translate.google.com, many of the men had ossified extensions of the frontal process which amounted to horns, and the same formation was occasionally found in the higher types of women. Curiously carven headdresses of gold were worn by both sexes and those of priestly rank adorned them with living serpents, and the high priest yet further with feathers or with wings, such being not the spoils of dead birds, but the blossoms of the live gold of the crowns. Some tradition of this custom is found in the pictures of the gods of Egypt, these gods being merely the Atlanteans whose mission civilized the country. The names of some of the earlier gods confirm this. No, Hebrew, Noah, is Atlantean for arch. Zu, Egypt, Shu, for many ideas connected with wind. Asi means kunos quasi serpents. And I translate. Vova like a snake. Obviously the name of an actual high priestess. Ra is pure Atlantean for sun. And Mise, Egyptian Khomse, for moon. The idea in Mise, Misr, Mise, is that of a strong woman, Mim, closing the mouth of a serpent, Sin, or dragon. And from this, we have the 11th card of the Bohemian Tarot and the legend and the apocalypse. In the mystic Greek used by the Gnostics, we find similar traces. Sophia being from S P H giving the idea of serpent breath in essence wisdom E I O is uh, they're written in Greek so I will translate them see if I can get them to sound Palot <laughs> Tari Pruktov, uh, which are translated here as phallus, comb, anus, and comb used euphemistically for vova. The word logos means the boy, lambda naturally engendered of the Virgin, capital Lambda, and the serpent, Sin. Theos, root Theta, first written, as we would write the symbol for sun, a dot with a circle around it, means the sun and his strength, and also Lingam, Yoni, conjoined. Christos is the love of passion of the rising sun and the serpent sigma. The I and T indicate certain details which are foreign to the present discussion.
Numa, Atlantean in M, is the arch of the woman. Maria, the woman of the sun. The words, well, and there's a note. Mar in Atlantean, also Sanskrit for die. This word throws light on their conception of death. Mikros and Abraxas are again derived from Atlas. Or Mithras and Abraxas are again derived from Atlas. The woman entered, Lingam, being conjoined with the Yoni, bears the sun from her serpent womb, and from the womb's mouth the sun, coming, seeketh a womb for his desire even the womb of a serpent, the course of the year being signified in this manner, as usual with the ancients. This plan of an idea corresponding to each letter was carried out very strictly. Thus, TLA, Tele, black, means the stigma or mark of the virgin's womb, Ia, Ia, hail, greeting, face to face, from the other peculiarity described above. In essence, the Latin passage. And the way in which its essential dogmatic symbols have been incorporated by the heirs of Atlas in the inmost sanctuaries of races which they deemed worthy of such assistance. Note that no tautologies defile its linguistic walls. As I have written, is never changed to, as I have observed, noted, described, said, indicated, remarked, pointed out, and so on. I must not pass over in silence the question of the sacrifices to the gods, to which a passing reference has already been made. Such sacrifices were not very frequent. The victims were the failures, those who were useless to the social economy. I must revert for a moment to the language. Oik, oik, Greek oikos, means the house of the penetrating men. Nom, Greek nomos, the arch of the house of the woman. In essence, that which roofed them in or protected them, hence the law. As they represented capital expenditure, the object was to recover this, at least since no interest could be expected. This victim was therefore handed over to a high priest or priestess who extracted the life by an instrument divide, uh, derived This victim was therefore handed over to a high priest or priestess who extracted the life by an instrument de derived or devised for and excellently adapted to the purpose so that it died by exhaustion. The life thus regained was given to the gods in a manner too complex to describe in this brief account. The early age at which puberty occurred was due to design. The normal period of gestation had also been shortened to four months. This was all part of the scheme to economize time. Old age had been almost done away with by the great readiness of the Atlanteans to go and see at the first sign of failing power. No doubt further improvements would have made, no doubt further improvements would have been made but for the loss of interest in the matter, all generating being regarded as the old experiment, not likely to repay the trouble of further research, in the two or three hundred years of man's full vigor, only eight years on an average was the wastage of childhood. And even this was not all waste, since some time at least must be necessary 
for the expert to discover and train the tendencies of the mind. The body ought, therefore, to be regarded as an engine, the theoretical limit of whose efficiency had been reached. So much I mention of the customs of the Atlanteans with regard to marriage, education, and religious sacrifice. Chapter 8 of the History of Atlas from its earliest origins to the period immediately preceding the catastrophe. The origin of Atlas is lost in the obscurity of antiquity. The official religious explanation is this. We came across under the waters on the living Atla, which is pious but improbable. A mystic meaning is to be suspected. The lay historian says, We came, escaping from destruction, eight persons in a ship, bearing the living Zerum. This reminds one of the later legends of presumably equal value. Poets frankly claim we descended from heaven, and it has been seriously urged that seafarers would have preferred to plains to the rocks. The law of contrariety to nature explains this away. Others maintain that the earliest settlers came by air or through air. This must mean balloons or aeroplanes, as flying was not known till centuries after. What is definitely known is that the earliest settlers were of a purely fighting race. An Atlantean Homer, Yolo, has described the first battle in such detail as to leave no doubt that he is retelling facts. A marked contradiction to his earlier books, there appear to have been but a few Atlanteans, unless the name, names given are those of chiefs, which internal evidence controverts. Their valor seems to have been prodigious. The natives were armed with every possible instrument of precision, having cavalry and artillery in abundance, as well as weapons that must have been as superior to the modern rifle, unless Yolo exaggerates, as that is to the arquebus. Also called harquebuses, any of several small caliber long guns operated by a match lock or wheel lock mechanism dating from about 1400. In spite of this, the men of Atlas smote them with rods or fell upon them with their cones and routed them utterly. They meant this mention of rods and cones has absurdly suggested to commentators that the Atlanteans used their eyes and hypnotized the enemy. To state such an opinion is sufficient to expose its author to the contempt of the thoughtful. Altogether, 86 battles were fought, extending over five years, before the natives were induced to sue for peace. This was granted on generous terms, which the colonists broke as soon as they dared to do so, in accordance with the invariable practice of colonists, then as much as today. However, it was nigh on a hundred years before the first College of Magic was established. Previously, the Atla had been carried about as occasion demanded. It was now enshrined in some decency. It was now enshrined with some decency of ceremonial upon a mountain. About three hundred years later, we find ourselves face to face with the first great mystery of Atlas. This is a translation of the record of that most strange event. Now it came to pass that all men turned black and died, and that the living Atla abode alone, bearing Mercury, whereof the sun knoweth. Thus came again the true men of Atlas, and their women, bearing gods and goddesses, and the void suffered nothing, and the earth was at peace, now then indeed arose art, and men builded, being blind, and there was light, and the scar of light wrought mischief. Therefore the wise men destroyed them with their magic, 
and there is no record because it is written in that which now is. A sort of si momentum queres circumspice seems here implied. In any case, there were clearly two gaps unbridgeable between the early struggles of the settlers, the period of great building and the modern period which proved stable of houses. The houses were only made possible by the perfecting of Zittel, and this helped considerably to fix the date. The next 2,500 years were years of peaceable progress. The labor mills were run without a hitch, and the next event was the discovery of black phosphorus. It had been the custom to worship the Atla with lights, and these lights had been candles of yellow phosphorus in golden sheaths. At that time, the Atla was veiled. At one festival of spring, the veils were burnt up, the lights extinguished, and the yellow phosphorus was found to have been turned into the black powder. The magicians examined this and brought Zero to its ninth stage. This revolutionized the condition of things. Old age and disease were no more, and death voluntary. Strangely enough, this led directly to the great conspiracy. At the end of this period of 2,500 years, the system of houses was well established. There were over 400 such houses, each perhaps 1,000 souls on average. These were governed by four houses of houses, whose rulers took orders from the high house, at the head of which was the living Atla. The plain principle of Atlas was revolution and like all revolutionary bodies, was obliged to adopt the strict form of autocracy. A democracy is often, a democracy is always suddenly conservative. A democracy is always suddenly conservative. The only hope is to catch it in one of its moments of crazy enthusiasm and crush it before it has time to recover. Caesar and Napoleon both did this so far as they could. Cromwell and Perfidio Diaz did the same with the narrower limits. Now a certain sophist, for philosophers one cannot call them, for now a certain sophist, for philosopher one cannot call him, tried to enunciate a magical law to the effect that the present standard of life was all that could be desired, that further progress would be harmful, that Venus was not worth attaining, and that the sole endeavor of the magicians should be to preserve things as they were, that such a proposition could be supposed a law reflects no credit on its author or its supporters, yet of these it found many. The ninth stage of Zero was a leap calculated to unsettle the calmest mind. Its reality had begged the optimists daydream. Poets had thrown down their stilettos. Needle sharp daggers of Zittel in its seventh stage were used to write on the rock walls of Atlas. High priests who had spent decades in hopeful experiment saw their results attained by an entirely different method. In short, two-thirds of the people were infected with the heresy and hoped to hear it promulgated as a law of magic. It should here be explained that every law of magic had its turn as the principal law of practical working, and the school supporting any law or insisting on it became prominent with it. Every dominant law in all history had always been made insignificant by a new discovery about Zittel, or other matter of practical importance, just as the peace with honor battle cry of Disraeli was drowned by the calculation of the cost of warships, soldiers, and patriotism. Each step in Zittel had consequently implied the rise of power of a new school, and the sophist was ambitious, 
And yet the law he wished to establish was the rule, ruling law of the servile races. The law was accordingly sent to the high house for approval. Some opposition may have been foreseen, but no one was prepared for the blackness of disapproval which actually radiated, striking hearts cold. A course without precedent was suspended. On the contrary, a course without precedent, the law was accordingly sent to the high house for approval. Some opposition may have been foreseen, but no one was prepared for the blackness of disapproval which actually radiated, striking hearts cold. A course without precedent, no answer was about safe. On the contrary, even normal communication was suspended. The houses which favored the innovation, 333, 333 in number, took counsel, came to the decision that it was useless to oppose the high house, and were about to acquiesce when a woman who had once been in the presence of, to her, rose and thought vehemently, the living Atla is the head of our conspiracy. In other words, they were the loyalists, the magicians of the high house, the rebels. This was why they had cut themselves off. Because their own head was against them, it was instantly resolved to go to the high house and demand the custody to her. Nearing the goal, however, a remnant of the ancient reverence half cowed even the ringleaders. I may mention that five of every six of the heretics were women. When they saw a stern phalanx of magicians, its point threatened, its point threatening their center. As they wavered, a woman cried, They are only men such as we. The ranks stiffened. On all sides, the army closed upon the tiny, tiny phalanx, which only numbered 56 all told. It was then that the truth was known. Ere a blow could be struck, the attacking party vanished. It was instantaneous and complete annihilation. From that moment, it was certain that the ruling power in Atlas was something. This matter is not open for discussion. Even at this distant date, it would be dangerous to do as much as indulge in speculation. Was something infinitely more awful than even the living Atla. In order to avoid any possible repetition of such a disaster, for the magicians of the High House knew that any manifestation of the Supreme must unto the work of centuries. They gave out that they had become too terrible to look upon and for the future they always appeared with heavy veils, or rather masks, since for the most part they were carven fantastically by the wearers in the leisure hours. A further alteration was made in the system of government. The head of one of the houses of houses was made supreme. The high house took no part in affairs of state. Thus the Atla was to all intents and purposes deposed, although the same reverence and sacrifice were paid to it as formerly. It became a constitutional monarch in our modern jargon. The next 2,000 years were years of serious trial in other ways. The toil of repopulation was excessive, and there was a revolt or rather strike of the servile races, which was ended by the substitution of bread from heaven for those products of the earth on which they had formerly been fed, a diet which proved so adapted to their nature that no labor trouble ever recurred. The Greek legends of the wars between gods, giants, titans are traditions of a real war or series of wars which continued with intervals for over 200 years. The enemy had developed naval armament to an extreme. This, Their tactics were these. 1. To wipe out the servile, servile races and so interfere with the production of Zero. 2. To rush and destroy the high house. 
the first of these men with a great deal of success. The floating rock being struck with the projectiles and sunk. This occurred chiefly on the outlying islands, where they were not too much afraid to make rage and force. They also sent epidemic diseases of many kinds. Atlas was reduced to such extremity in these days that at one time the waterways were forced and the assault on the high house was actually carried out, bombardment continuing day and night for months together. Through a misunderstanding of a well-known magical law, Atlanteans at that time considered themselves prohibited from employing any other defense than the rods and the cones of their forefathers, and these, it appears, were useless against machinery or against men protected by fortification in such a way that they could not be got at from any quarter. Thus the shark-like submarines of the enemy were unassailable. The war was therefore at first entirely one-sided. A certain youthful magician, however, resolving to die for his country if need were, decided to retaliate. He had found that Zero, in its nascent state, in essence, between the globes, had the power of bringing about endothermic reaction, seawater, for example, becoming caustic soda and hydrochloric acid, and further, that this acid thus produced was many times more active than in its normal state. For example, the rock basin in which he conducted his first experiment dissolved as rapidly as butter under burning oil. He then prepared a number of pairs of receiver globes and dropped them in the vicinity of the enemy submarines by night. In this manner, he destroyed the hulls of almost the whole fleet in a single night, and the remainder fled in panic at dawn. They returned the following year, carrying out daylight raids only and devoting themselves to destroying the labor mills. The young magician had been rewarded for his services by being presented to the Atla, and this example encouraged others to find means of attacking the invaders. Artificial darkness was therefore invented and combined with the former method, but this was only partially successful the tremendous pace of the sharks enabling them to evade any threatening clouds. They did enormous damage, and the supplies of Zero were seriously curtailed. Things now went from bad to worse, and culminated in the attack on the high house, the besiegers keeping their battleships surrounded by rafts of fire, so that attack was impossible even by night. It was then that the High House called on the heroism of its sons. Armed with long swords of zero, they plunged into the sea to perish indeed under the tooth of the Zizu, but not before they had time to hack the invading battleships to shreds. Their floating torch rafts only assisted the attack by directing the swimmers to their quarry. The attack on the High House had roused Atlas at last. A counter-invasion was plotted and carried out with immediate and complete success. The enemy being exterminated and their country not merely ravaged, but destroyed by arousing the forces of earthquake. All activity of this kind being, however, deprecable, a recurrence was guarded against by removing the high house from the lofty mountain previously described and a house was chosen to cultivate the art of war and entrusted with the duty of destroying any living thing that might approach within a hundred miles of Atlas.
Only one other adventure of historical importance remains to be recorded. It is the attempt of some foolish Atlanteans to found an empire, and so to be entirely distinguished from the missionary effort referred to previously. The original settlement of Atlas, as has been the case with all flourishing colonies, was made by a few hardy pioneers who strengthened themselves by growth, but Atlas, in her momentary madness, poured out blood and treasure in the fatuous attempt to impose alien domination on lands utterly unsuited to the genius of the people. The idea, of course, was to increase the supply of labor and consequently the output of crude zero. In the first place, the adventure was expensive. It was uneconomical in, sci in the scientific sense to send ships with less than 1,000 fighting men. The zero required for these meant the employment of at least 7,000 serviles, and naval construction was therefore of a colossal order. But although little difficulty was found in conquering the country in the military sense, the natives had to be almost exterminated and the labor of the survivors proved difficult to enforce. It was even then not a tenth as efficient as that of the serviles at home. The imported serviles, moreover, caught native diseases and died in hundreds. And though by prodigious sacrifices, the East African Empire was kept going for nearly 200 years. It had to end at last no less ingloriously than the French adventure in Mexico or the English in India, Egypt, and South Africa. I write little, but not much, in advance of the events. To illustrate the theory here, advanced, I will ask the reader to compare the results of the attempt to colonize America by a. The whole military power of Spain at her zenith. B. The handful of exiles in the Mayflower. The main cause was the impossibility of breeding children in a climate so unsuitable even of maintaining their own women. And above all, the fact that the Krutzetl was not of quality equal to that obtained in Atlas, and that the zittle generated by the Atlanteans themselves was not to be made at all outside their own country. The lesson was learnt. Until the end, no further attempt was made to advance in any but the true direction. The great majority of the colonists returned to Atlas, but many degenerated but many degenerating, as is the fashion with colonists of this conquering kind, abandoned Zeto for gross food, intermarried with the natives, and have generally degenerated yet further to races inferior even to the present descendants of those who were, in those days, equivalents of the serviles of Atlas. Chapter 9 of the Catastrophe, Its Antecedents and Presumed Causes. In my remarks on Zero, I gave a necessarily somewhat diffuse account of the properties of this remarkable substance. It must now be made clearer that the crude Zero in its nine stages, produced by the serviles and consumed in the houses, 
was in each stage of inferior quality to that of the same degree produced by the Atlanteans and consumed by the high house. For example, the crude zero was made in a labor mill with all sorts of insulations. The first stage of the priests zero could be made anywhere at any time and naturally directed itself to the receptacle for it without any precautions. It must, I think, be presumed that the zero generated in the high house was again of far greater purity and potency. Very little of it can have been used in the experiments of the magicians, and it is therefore necessary to account for enormous quantities. Produced during many centuries of uninterrupted labor, I have, however, no data of any kind for this investigation. The mysteries of the high house have ever been inscrutable and were not wholly delivered to the heirs of Atlas. They must be rediscovered by the magicians of the new race. It may be that in some form or other, the zero had been made stable and used to impregnate the column which is alleged to have been driven through the earth, perhaps, and less improbably, only to the depth of a few hundred miles. This column, however long it may have been, had certainly its top immediately below the reservoir of the high house. It had been completed about 70 years before the catastrophe, but apparently no attempt was made to utilize it in any way. To me, it appears probably that in some one mind the whole catastrophe was brooding, that the column was part of the device, and that the event which I shall now describe was the other part. This event was the birth of a child in the high house, a child without the distinguishing mark of the daughters of Atlas. That any child at all should have been born there is so incredible that I am inclined to suspect an improper use of the word born. I think rather that a magician brought the zero to its 11th stage when it takes human form and lives. The alternative theory is that of the angel of Venus, described in the chapter on the underground gardens of Atlas. The supporters of this theory hold that the child was not born of a priestess, but of the living Atla. In any case, the whole country gave itself to unbridled rejoicing. Work was carried on at a greater speed than ever before. One might say a delirium of labor. For 11 years, this continued without secession. And then without warning came the order to repair to the high house, every man, woman, and child of Atlas. What was then done, I know not, and dare not guess. That same day, seven volunteers, heroic exiles from the reward of so many centuries of toil, voluntary maroons, on the discarded planet, the heirs of Atlas turned their faces from the high house, and severally sought distant mountains, there each to guard his share of the secrets of the holy race, and in due time to discover and train up fit children of other races of the earth, so that one day another people might be founded to undertake another such task as that now ended. Hardly had the pinnacle of Atlas melted into the sea behind them than the catastrophe occurred. The high house and the column beneath it, with all the inhabitants of the altar, shot from the earth 
with the vehemence of a million lightnings, bound for that green blaze of glory, the scintillated, that scintillated in the west above the sunset. Instantly the earth, its god departed, gave itself up to anguish. The sea rushed into the void of the column, and in a thousand earthquakes, Atlas, houses, and plains together were overwhelmed forever in the ocean. Tidal waves rolled round the world. Everywhere, great floods carried away villages and towns. Earthquakes rocked and tempests roared. Tumult was triumphant. For years after, the catastrophe, the dying tremors of the event still shook mankind with fear. The legend of the deluge is derived from this event. And the eternal waves of the Great Mother rolled over Atlas, save where Earth in her agony thrust up gaunt pinnacles, bare mass of wreckage to mark the vanished continents, save for their heirs of whose successors it is my highest honor to be the youngest and least worthy, oblivion fell like one last night in which the sun should be forever extinct upon the land of Atlas and its people. Shall such high purpose fail of emulation, such achievement not example, and excite us to like striving? Then let earth fall indeed from her high place in heaven, and mankind be outcast forever from the sun. Men of earth, Seek out the heirs of Atlas. Let them order you into a phalanx. Let them build you into a pyramid that may pierce the appointed, which awaits you, to establish a new dynasty of Atlanteans, to be the mainstay and mainspring of the earth, the pioneers of their own path to heaven and to our Lord and Father, the Son. And he put his hand under his thigh and swore it. By the ineffable Wa'la and by the holy Zero did he swear it and entered into the body of the new Atla that is alive upon the earth. Transcribers note, this text of Liber Li, or Liber 51, L-I, has been transcribed from two TSS in the OTO archives, one from the collection of H.P. Smith, the other formerly in the possession of Phyllis Seckler, the latter which appears to be later than and derived from the other, includes an introduction here omitted by W.T. Smith, Freighter 132, and internal evidence gives it a date some time between 1951 and 1962. Anno Domini. Both TSS are more or less fair copies. The second contains some handwritten corrections of typist errors, some marginal notes apparently by Karl Germer, Frater Saturnus, and Greek has been handwritten in, in a different hand to the marginalia. Footnotes are by Crowley unless otherwise indicated. Lieber Lee has been published under the title Atlantis, Malton, Ontario, Dove Press, 1970, with a brief introduction by Kenneth Anger, and a paperback edition by Morton Press, England, in 1974, and in two different editions in the 1980s. 
Ginkgo Press, OTO, 1985, Stellar Visions, 1986. A new edition was recently, summer 2003, Erevoga, said to be in preparation by the OTO. Copyright Ordo Templi Orientis. Key Entry and Formatting by Freder T.S. This reading by Christopher Robert Neal, Esquire. At the tone, the time will be 10.04 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 February 2020, Anno Domini Caesar, Tuesday, 15 degrees Aquarius. The two millionth four hundred fifty eight thousand eight hundred eighty fourth Julian Day, courtesy of the Um Al Qura calendar of Saudi Arabia. End of this reading.